This is VTWRLM322. How many years? Just some stubborn crickets. I'm just thinking about it. Just sitting here. Funny when my mind goes waiting for the broadcast, everything hooking up, watching, make sure that things get hooked up. How long has it been I've been playing crickets? Is really pretty astonishing. Pretty disappointing, but real astonishing. Why? Because once I told you about the crickets and what, I were, what they're about, nobody really stood up. And so it's not looking too good. And I'll say that every week, I suppose, until I get it past it myself. But it seems like that needs to be repeated over and over. What am I talking about? Well, you taking up that republic that you was gave and keeping it, which you haven't. And so if you want to live here, the United States of America, which is an example, there's an example for the rest of the world here as well that seems to be lost. You've got to have to step up and keep what you probably haven't had or enjoyed, but was always been there to do so. And I didn't come onto that just because I'm so brilliant. I came onto that after I got shown this military consequence 30-something years ago and caused me to go, wait a minute, that's not what's supposed to happen here, so why is it happening? And that inquiry led me to here. And uh, in the middle of that process, I found where this thing called the law of the land is, not the one you constitutionalists are pointing out to in Article 6. That's the evidence of a trap. The one that was happening from with, uh, with regard to the law of the land itself. And when you see what that land, law of the land, does and means, you'll re you should realize, and well, the main principle there is we hold land in the United States of America even against the government. Now, yes, there's an Article 5 problem with the uh, public. Uh, don't, the public has some higher rights, so-called, but I've also learned that that right has to come higher than the one that you have in your property. It's just not a hand-me because eminent domain exists. And so there's a whole other way to look at what's going on. We handed, it every, we handed everything over to these people that we didn't keep that republic. We didn't keep that real law of our land from which our production rights come from, which our wealth comes from. And we allowed all this nonsense on us and all, and all, all kinds of it. And I'm not even talking a lot. Most people listening to me are only, they're like uh, internet, internet uh, babies. There, there's knowledge that goes so far back, they didn't even understand about any of this stuff. Yeah, almost the way of the world, folks. And, and we come into this place in the United States of America and, and didn't know what to do with it. And that was done on purpose, too. But, but it's not an excuse either. And I guess that's the point. As I hear crickets all this time, and you have it in your hands to do, why hasn't it been done? Looks like a big mental illness to me after a while. I say that with a lot of love now, folks. I'm not calling you a bunch of mental cases, but we are. As a society, we are. And so, this, just as I'm sitting here, I just realized, man, these crickets are going, I'm tired of these crickets, folks. Uh, aren't you? Even a few seconds a week. Aren't you tired? To understand those crickets mean we're failing as a society? We're failing locally now. Like, you know, that seems to be too big. You're failing in yourself. Well, you all deny about it. You'll say that you have a very excuse about how that's not the case. I'm telling you that it, it is the case, and you can deny me until you find out that you that I was right. And I'm not right because I'm right. I'm right because there's a condition. And if we don't per perceive it correctly and address it, we'll walk in and become the fodder that you're planned to be because of that ignorance. And I to come here every week to try and get somebody to some more else to step up and do some things around them around them make that wrong find the wrong to make it right even the smallest thing just start to take responsibility for harms that are going on it's not just you is the other thing and I, and as i now get further into my studies and application of these things i see that uh, the remedies that we're not uh, addressing are the one remedies we need to in mass each one of us this is not an army necessarily it's each one of us we become that army we don't even know that is the other interesting device and for those of us that want to believe we're humans instead of men and uh, women the human animal the gorilla that we need to be doing those gorilla tactics in this regard 
because by ourselves we're actually the minority. If we're all a bunch of gorillas doing gorilla tactics, well, then we're a bunch of monkeys doing tactics, but we're a whole lot better off than sitting here smug in some belief that we have a knowledge, and that somehow is going to change the world or be protective or invoke the future. And I try to get, again, it's about what we do, not about what we think or say. And it's our actions every day. And it's what we what we make priority to. And there is the pressure of the everyday life. That's another thing that, that was done to us. And we keep, you know, again, the Matrix is not a movie. They gave, they found out if you give everything, if you have everything, then you get discontent because you have everything. It's the nature of your creature. So, but if you're given the problems to solve, now you're in drama to to create and solve within your your own existence, then you're focused on that and not on the larger things which the puppeteers control. And you you know they're there because they're they're infringing upon your life. Whether or not you truly understand their nature is a totally different issue and how to address it. And so I've come along and said, well, you know, my, there's a certain way to abra- approach this. I took leads. I didn't I didn't bring my knowledge more important than than a reality I was finding, that you'll have to find yourself, that I guide you, I can guide you to the path and show you some of the points, and you'll find it yourself, you'll find it your way, and apply, hopefully applying your skill sets, and you'll put yourself on a path where your skill sets are most advantageous. And that'll help, I mean, that's just a, all the difference in the world. You don't, you don't, you're not just flailing about, you're actually focusing in on something and doing a particular thing that you can do well. Again, I can do a lot of things on my own, uh, but I'm really grateful for my colleagues that they we take us uh, within the the subject matter that we're addressing. Uh, each one of my colleagues has a different uh, specialty in themselves, and I tend to be able to pull that together and bring it into a bre- the best presentation among us. And that's my place in in that whole point. Even though I can do it myself, it's nice to have the help. Well, that doesn't happen by not choosing to do something. You have to get in and commit yourself. As long as this is, uh, you hear the crickets, you're hearing a society that's failing to do that. And I don't put an excuse. I put no reason for that because we have no reason. There's no excuse that will stop this. Now, people tend to want to make a question out of, well, what what do we do? Well, it's not, here's a, what do we do? Well, that's the problem. You actually need to go in the bathroom, look at the mirror, and then ask that question. What do we do? And unless... Me, myself, and I is the we you be talking about. It's about you. It's about the one in the mirror looking back. What are you going to do? It's I, not we. Now, you may walk out of that mirror and go find someone that you live with that can help you. If they walk in the mirror too and they go, what can I do? And they walk out with that question into the living room and listen to this broadcast or not. Listen to whatever breads and circuses you want to do. It starts with the I do not we now you may find a, once you do i that there's a we but until you do an i what am i doing doing not thinking not not excusing but doing what have i chosen to make right and what am i doing about that then you might start finding a we and it, it, as i said just as i entered into this the subtlety is each one of us doesn't do the same thing we all have our strengths. And so you may start out with you by yourself like I have and then slowly build up things. When you jump in, certain opportunities happen. And even the opportunity of learning more correctly was a big one. And then things come in through that. And if you're thinking about it and applying it, you start making your own your own weaponry, essentially, your own, your own path, your own tactics that uh, you find that you have to make because the you, you're outnumbered and outpositioned and outmoneyed and everything else. And yet that can't be an excuse either. So, I, again, as I start entering the broadcast, i got all this stuff in my mind. It starts to develop while I'm waiting two minutes to, to see everything hook up right. And so I'm off on a different tangent, but, but consistent with my message, if it's a, anything to be listened to, which I think it is. Again, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, caused di- change over time, as slow as it is, the colleagues that I work with weren't causing change over time, and I'm not talking minuscule stuff, then I probably wouldn't be talking to you. But when I see people in the world, their houses are burning, their forests are burning down, your wealth is being destroyed, your livelihoods, your homelessness is up, 
your kids, your little ones, your goats, your little goats, your, your kids are being destroyed by this corporate condition when you don't recognize what you're dealing with is a war scenario, when you don't see that that you have to answer in certain ways to that, notwithstanding all the free you think you is, I have uh, I, I don't know what more to do. I'm here to try and help people solve those problems for themselves. And there's techniques to do it. And if it's not the ultimate techniques at this point, I don't care. There are techniques that work at this point. You can learn better as you move. But I haven't seen anybody has any techniques so that we're all sitting here floundering. And pretty soon we're going to get a hook in our mouth and be yanked out and clubbed in the head like a big flounder that we are because we're floundering instead of focusing and doing something. Again, what do we do? No, you have to, it's you, each one of you, what do I do? And that's the first problem. You're not listening to what I'm saying, and then you don't choose something to go do. And it, any gripe you have is where you can start. You can make a list. It doesn't matter. You, make a list. you can have 50,000 gripes. Write them all down. Then, then stop griping. Go and find one in there, as I was explaining last week or week before, Choose one. Just go after it. Now, I tend to speak more in foundational law of the land law land things. I tend to then extrapolate that out from those that are trespassing upon all that, because it's basic law. Nothing, no, no, amended, no, um, ad, uh, adjective law. It's law, and it's provable by documentation. It's the most foundational thing that I've found can teach. It taught me, teaches me how to approach it. And I would ask anybody to get into those things. And then you have to deal with it in that level, like any of this stuff. And anyway, I'm also already beyond everybody if you haven't chosen something to be responding to. Everyone has, again, I just see some, lots of questions, but nobody wants to sit down and take responsibility to give themselves the answer. And we have that answer is the other thing. I mean, just, I'm getting to a point, I guess, I'm just not seeing what, why the excuses continue. We've been, we've been growed up long enough, I think. And I think I've been telling you all quite a long time on how this works. Uh, to get no response uh, in lots of it is telling. And it's, well, it's, it's telling. I don't, don't know what more to say about that. That's the answer. It's telling. Maybe that's the title of the broadcast. Maybe not. And I asked a question last week, and I forgot to get back to it as things go. But it doesn't matter. I was waiting. I uh, went back through, and I can't remember anybody answering the question. Even especially the people are warmed up for trivia, uh, the three hours before uh, on Grimner's broadcast for the uh, blues and rock show, you can hear music right before this broadcast. I asked a question last week relative to something I'd found, which I thought the answer was pretty interesting, relative to other people making ideas about what they think they live in. And I'm one to look out because of the deceptions. I look at... I don't know, it's not a paranoia, it's actually an analysis that has to be done, that I do. I want to know what I'm being told, and I want to identify if it's coming through many, any one of any many lines of deception that I've identified, in order to be able to see what, identify the deception, and then be able to avoid it. Looking into the future, again, behold the future, behind the woodshed is one of my little tags that says you, you come and learn the principles, and your future will change than if you didn't that you learn the principles of, uh, of identifying these things and you start to be able to apply them as they were applied against people in history. We call them psyops and all kinds of things. We see this as the propaganda tools. We see this in the, what Edward Bernays being able to take women in a culture from, from where they were into where they are. And you then see all the detriment to those people that got shifted because they didn't have a strong mind about what was going on. They didn't understand critically what they were actually told decades and decades before they could be manipulated. And uh, so uh, there were our, our creature, our animal creature is, uh, is, is fed with information and we tend to adopt that. And we take the easiest route. Nature works against us in that regard. And I asked a question. I said, uh, what does this define? And then the, the statement is, it's a simple short statement, what does this define? Theoretically, there is no state control. What I found interesting about that is because I hear lots of people talking about a condition where they espouse that or something very similar. What my problem with all this is, is you start, a, you start doing certain things that 
my studies show is not actually the truth, and I realize we're dealing with a psyop that leads you in and down the road a piece into being able to assimilate and accept things that you don't even know are, and, and do, they do a technique like I've learned how to do when you want to, for instance, I do it with the word treason because people don't understand that's an odd term, and people um, don't will use that word to pigeonhole you. When I approach the term treason in a document to someone who is committing it, or whether it's a it's a an inquiry like a show cause, I do not use the word. I use the definition. And so it's a long form to say the same word. And you got to make sure you use the right one because a lot of words have many definitions. Some don't. And so, as an example, you can be handed a long-form word of something you actually don't understand, and then a whole group of people come in and start using that that phraseology, the idea of that, to bring up an idea, then give it a term that isn't what that is that you adopt. But you, what you've done more to yourself is you've adopted the principle. That I found this definition and just a happenstance find to be very telling of a thing I've noticed, and it really irks me a bit because the definition sets are all wrong and they're based in the wrong thing, and uh, it's being done by a lot of people that they believe that when you when I hear their words, uh, they answer to this phrase. Theoretically, there is no state control. I also hear no state control would be the term of uh, someone who embraces this, uh, the counter to this, would be a statist. And so I hear that vocabulary. But there, this theoretically, there is no state control would speak to a lot of people that embrace an idea. And this is the problem of the idea. When you do another definition set that's not consistent, and then you attach yourself to something like this, you would necessarily down the road start to embrace the softer cell of the idea of a system. This ends up being an ism, like all of them, that you embrace the promise of no state control. So, no one answered last week. All the trivia people didn't answer. I didn't get any emails. What does this define? The statement, theoretically, there is no state control. And so I didn't give you the answer last week. I'll give it to you right now, and I'm not going to it's not me to give. I'm going to give it right off the website I found. It's on a column of two isms. Theoretically, there is no state control defines communism. That defines communism. If you didn't understand that, then anybody who goes into this status and non-status, anti-status condition, is actually being walked in the future into the presentations and promises of no state control. And this is the subtlety. It's not the only one that's happening. It's one example. I'd never really seen it defined that way. But it's there. It's, I went through and found some other places. And then you have to understand that communism is a, another form. It's kind of like on the same bar, but on the maybe opposite ends of extremism with socialism. And so I've looked at that definition, that definition answer, that there is no state, theoretically there's no state control. It doesn't mean that it, that it has ever happened. What it is is that that's the ism that takes on that title. That a lot of people that are believing that there's a, that there's a no state that you want is walking yourself into this in your mind. And what you then do is you start to adopt over time the soft cell of all the elements that bring that on. Now we see some people a lot more susceptible to it than others. But I'm watching a whole bunch of people who believe they're critical thinkers being inculcated with this concept. It doesn't come to you as communism. It comes to you as a definition, a long-form definition. And you mentally buy in to it. And these people are brilliant about how they do this. I guess so this is a word of warning. If you think you can rely on on this condition where you, you, you want an existence of no state control, be careful of what the future has has in it for you based in that. And so I would offer that you adjust how you look at the world, again, to the realities, not what you make up or what people tell you to make up or what you think you've made up because other people say so. You need to go research way back 
so that you figure out what the real lineage is, not as tailored in the warm and fuzzy ways that are done to get you to get your mind to uh, malleable enough to uh, take on this stuff. As I've been saying, you be careful. You go, one of the terms is anarchism, right? You know, no, no rulers. I got no rulers. Be careful on that one. You better have at least yourself as a ruler, and then you better realize there's someone else out there. And if you're Cain, if you're not Cain, you, they're, they're, you're an Abel, and there may be a Cain out there well, coming after you. So there's a reality about all these things, and you could get your mind to start absorbing the idea that there's no state, and theoretically that means you believe in communism, even though the word you use today is different. You're now making yourself acceptable to certain ideas. And they come in so subtly that it takes how many years, and we're still talking about things like climate change or uh, the green jobs bill. We're t- talking about destruction of your environment. The we talk about conservation. It's a war crime. People don't even understand all this stuff. They take it on. Uh, they think it's a good idea. They don't. They don't realize the the people who who started this didn't. Well, they treated you like the United States government does in its own code. Men and women are treated as pest animals. I keep telling you about that. Go read it. Don't take my word for it. Go read it for yourself. No different than I've exposed to about everybody now. But anybody wants to have a mind is to read it and go see it. That you're, what is your civil rights? Your equal rights? They're, they're, they're the right. You accept extortion. And so when you take the statuses that are in there, you are accepting extortion. It's not about consent. In fact, we were talking uh, last night. Somebody came up. I should get to there here pretty soon. Get back to the tabs. Let me get to uh, right after the first one here. It's not about uh, to dissent either. A dissent is just the withholding of asset, and it's bet way more than just that. So these terms are instructive. Uh, they can be confusing, but and you could dismiss them. But there's a very uh, l- there's lessons to be learned in understanding language again. So I hope. Here, the theoretical, theoretically there is no state control speaks to those that would uh, use the term statist when they think they're not embracing a state by saying it. And you think that means freedom. Those that have the control and the power understand that to be communism. Therefore, by definition, there's a state you live in. And the word state is very interesting. Kind of like the capital S state, the kid lower S state, and then you get all those of you that want to get all uppity about the words. Oh, it's just language. Yeah, it's how we communicate amongst ourselves. It's kind of important. Otherwise, you you don't you start sounding like a, a blithering idiot, and that's what the problem is. I'm hearing. I'm hearing a lot of these crickets are like blithering idiots. They don't understand how to solid up their language in order so we can actually understand what the heck they're what side of the fence they might be, whether they're in the fence at all, whether they're even talking about reality. And again, that's how the the other side is working. They don't talk about reality. They talk about the world that they want, that they want you to buy into, and you eventually do. Just like the Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars says, you'll plug in. You plug in when you oppose it and don't respond to it as well. And that's the most subtlest deceit. So, theoretically, there is no state. Control defines communism. Be careful on those of you that believe that there is no state, because all that they may they not have, have not been able to pull it off, but theoretically they can pull it off, and you'll buy right into that. And that's why I I assume different. Yeah, I know the word assume. I took assumption, yeah, another legal term, of different things, not because I, it's my choice. It's because it's a necessity to take on those. Assume assumption, assumptions of reality, at least as I perceive them. And this is where we start to move along. We get to the thing that's occupying you and the presumption, the presumption that you are having to meet. And when you have a presumption against you, you don't have an ability to dissent to that. That's not a good objection. And that's what we talk about here coming on. I'll move on to the tabs here, moving on further. So I didn't get any answer to that question. I know, and I'm uh, interested that no answer came from even the people that uh, would respond to that uh, in their own belief, which means that they really don't have a, you all don't have a foundation. You really don't. And so another thing is, it's easy. Just stay away from the isms. Go by function. I guess that's what I didn't finish saying. 
Stop what you believe and look at what's functioning. How do things function? Again, the deed. How's it working? And when it when it's not working to keep the peace or it's not working to keep people safe, then you have to question that and put it in a place of function. And then you have to say, I guess one of the next questions, can it hurt me or others? And something that is hurting you or others ought to be a focus and a priority. So I don't know, I don't know what, so I say, I don't get into the isms, the ists. I don't get into, I really don't get into any of that. It's not because I'm trying to be avoiding and if I don't take on a name, uh, then uh, I'm not, uh, I, I'll somehow I feel like I'm, I'm different than everybody. No, because I'm innocent of things. If I'm truly innocent, those aren't, those are labels that don't attach to me. So I'm sitting in a presumption of innocence and then I'm just going out in the world and doing, doing what my thing is and I find everywhere there's a, there's an oppression. And that didn't settle with me well. And certainly when it, uh, it reared its ugly head and put my life, literally in life in, in jeopardy in, in the next moment. And so here we are again, uh, returning back around today. What do we do about this oppression? And I've been offering what you do in a way I don't hear anybody talk. In fact, there's something coming down. They're pur- purging all kinds of people. The New York Times and I got a big article about all the being brainwashed to the right and all this other stuff. Remember, I was um, I got the, I got the Twitter the, the, behind which said I'm really right of everyone. I'm, the law has become right of all sectors of society, even even the Trumpster, the self-declared Trumpster, even you know, MAGA. When they identified what I was saying as right of them, you realize everything is left in, in a political sense. And all I'm talking about is objective basis of communication between people to keep the peace. Explains a big deal there if you understand what I'm really, what I, if you understand what I've been saying. I'm simply speaking in the terms of com- proper, more proper communication so that everyone gets to their point much quicker and I'd identify as the oppressors against them and, and I get flack or nothing. And I'm blamed to be right. And when the, so when the right is, when the law and proper communication is, is right, extreme right of your entire society, not even in Houston, we have a problem. So I don't know the answers. I can just tell you that things have to be addressed and I can tell you how to best start approaching them. One of the ways that we, little evidence is that we hear that things emit. The glitches in that matrix that's not a movie, the glitches that you see are telling us things. Again, we can choose to pick them up or not. I've been asking people, was it Jonathan Corbett, I think is his name. He's been heavily on the TSA. I haven't even gone back to his website to even know. But this, his mind, his, his name seems to come on my mind about someone that wants to do something about the TSA. And I told you, Join up with him if you feel that you have to. You want to travel. You're going to have to do this way years in the future when you want to actually use this. So this is even a harder one to approach. But it's so important that you can team up with someone like Jonathan Corbett who wants to work on the TSA, but start approaching it the way I've been suggesting you instead of as questions or dismay or assertions of unconstitutionality. All that's opinion. And the occupier... The occupier's rule wins, and so you have to bring a different record. You have to bring a record that shows clearly that that's not the case. And one little thing pops up, and this has been a long-term observation of mine, and I wondered when this was, was going to come, and here it is. When was it going to pop up? When, when I was telling you, we have the extensions of the right of ingress and egress that come from our properties and outward, and that you're put pigeonholed into a commerce entity and not a production entity, First of all, not a man or woman, certainly ever. Uh, that we hear this interesting little news story that pops out: the TSA allowing illegal migrants to fly without proper documents. Listen again: TSA allowing illegal migrants to fly without proper documents. Now, I'm, I've been on y'all to understand what jurisdiction, authority, jurisdiction and authority is, how you identify it, how do you test it when it wants to assert itself. And uh, this is starting to be, I think, a crack in that porcelain uh, for those of you that want to eventually get back to being able to travel free among the country. A TSA allowing illegal immig- illegal migrants. Well, le- illegal migrants is an interesting term, and I think it's a, I don't even know how, how that even att- approach that. You're just a migrant, and I don't know how you're illegal, and then how you get something 
from a governmental agency when you're supposed to be illegal. We have so many problems in that relative to the United States being a district and the Union of States being their independent countries. Uh, and then the federal oversight of all this trans, uh, this movement of people, all kinds of entities too, through. But uh, illegal migrants fly without proper documents. Well, right on its face, how do they get proper documents is an interesting thing. And are they subject to begin with? Well, when you find out they're not subject, actually, except for their, immigra- their immigration attempt, they, they are not subject generally. And that gives us another clue as to how the government is still dealing with these, but you don't have any proper documents and still get what you want. It's the status I've been trying to explain how you establish for those of you that have been paying attention. It's not going to be easy. This is probably the worst one right now because they've been ramping this one up, ramping this up, and locking you out of your travel and getting, getting the, again, getting you underneath the servitudes, uh, which I tell you are, adva- are pre- addressed initially through the administrative side where you set up a record. The federal agency tasked with overseeing security and transportation hubs has been violating its own policy by allowing migrants who have been released from federal custody onto flights despite not having required documents, according to several Department of Homeland Security officials. For the past six months, the Transportation Security Administration has allowed migrants released from the custody of Homeland Security agencies to board flights to other parts of the country despite the passengers lacking any of the 15 documents it states are the only acceptable forms of identification. Now, I'll just stop. I mean, I could read. I could stop. What 15 documents? Well, that's listed here. There's 15 documents that are stated. What are the ones that a migrant would have? There's none. So we wouldn't even expect it. Can they stop people from actually traveling? Well, I don't think so. And you see, they can't. But we talk about it as a policy concern, not the law. And so my observation on this is here's another view. You will wish to see this. It's right here. But there's a limit to this authority. And and so my, my initial response to this was it says, when you read the rules, it says that they must show. And I've gone through this before. This isn't even new news. This is all the same restatement of everything I've been telling you, that how you approach how this works, that states that you must show these identifications. Now, what does that mean? Well, you got to get it in the administrative jurisdiction. What does must mean in the administrative jurisdiction? You'll find after research, and again, I say it that way, you need to do the research to see this proof to yourself so you know it's not a joke, it's not a, a distant opinion, but must is not imperative. It is, if you will, administratively mandatory until there's an impossibility proven. So it's only must. They can't make it a shell because you may not fit the policy relative to the intention and purpose. So the rule says that it must show identity, identification. Well, interesting. It doesn't say shall. So I know administratively there's no imperative there. And therefore, therefore there is a limit to that, uh, that administrative authority. It's where you're going to go and stick your little gig in the frog and you're going to figure out whether it jumps or not. It says must show. Are you prepared with your record to show you can't comply? It also says in the discussion that uh, those that choose not to cooperate will suffer it increased scrutiny. My question to you, if you chose not to, what if you can't cooperate? And the lack of documentation would prove that on at least one proof, wouldn't it? So they put it in the context of choosing. You have to alter that context, and I would do this ahead of time. Well, we're not choosing to not cooperate. We can't cooperate. What am I doing? I'm pushing on that must, aren't I? Because once I establish a record that I can't, and there's nothing I can get. And then, as I would explain to you, and I have before, you expound that the documents would cause you to commit fraud in order to acquire them. Now you're setting a record that they cannot prevail with you on. And so the question was all this hubbub, hubbub here about, oh, the immigrant, illegal migrants are able to travel. Really is one that they're not subject. 
and they haven't allowed themselves to be subject, and they're not able to be subjected, and all you all have become subjected. You haven't read the most basic stuff to understand how you start cutting those ties. Now, I'm in a time, mental time now, where I've told you, if I hadn't had a cut most of all mine, and it's not like I'm free to move about the country myself because I haven't done this addressment, although, well, I don't have a plan to move any, to go anywhere, so it I don't. My focus is on other things. So those of you that have this as a as an, a thing you want to make right, you would have to cut your ties. You'd have to make a record that showed that you could cut your ties and look like a migrant, but you're not illegal. That's the simplest thing I can tell you right there. I hope that triggered some light bulbs. You just make yourself look like the thing they don't can't get the the material to documents to. You put it in a position of impossibility. I had to add that. You put it in a position of fraud for you to act. And then I add on top of that that it would be violation of your inherent right through your property rights to travel to do any of that because they're in commerce. These are all commerce regulations under this idea called national security. Well, if migrants, people who are outside of the jurisdiction of the states, and the federal government can travel, notwithstanding the additional harassment they're giving, then I think that you have the real ability to do, to do the same. Now, I say think, but I know that you do. Whether or not you'll get that will determine how bad the occupier wants you not to know and wants to keep control of you, which is a whole other different proof. And the more of you doing this will be helpful. So, if you choose not to, what if you can't? If you decline to cooperate... What if there isn't anything to offer? What if you're proving that their demands, their policy demands, are an infringement of your abilities? And a forced association, violation of the Constitution now, a forced association with statuses that you aren't and can't be. And so I ask, what's the big story here? Why is this a story at all? Except for me, it looks like it's in the, 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 the crack in the porcelain relative. Why are people upset that migrants get to fly, uh, fa- uh, travel about the country? What's the issue? If they're the example and evidence of how you do that. Because why are you all worried about getting your fifth, one of your 15 documents? Have you ever looked at those documents? We talked about the driver's license, what that is. Go look at your state's statutes over what that jurisdiction is. It's certainly not in your right to travel. It's certainly not in your right to drive. It's certainly not it's certainly not in the road law and the extension of ingress and egress. And it's certainly not under the grants. No, it's a very particular addressment, which is actually under federal control as well. So if you understand what I've been saying, by attacking the state provision, you're also attacking the federal, which you end up having to deal with at the TSA. So what's this issue that a migrant gets to travel free and you don't and you're upset about that? But a bunch of whiners is all I can see. Because if you understood what they were telling you in that, that a migrant who's not part of the country, part of the United States, part of the states, asking for a privilege, they still travel. And the, and the, the TSA gives a stupid answer or responded. If you look at what they're saying, you can still defeat it in the answer. It's, they're, they're covering up this point is what they're doing. And so I, I say at the, the tweet response is maybe we're seeing evidence of where policy is not meeting law or antecedent rights. And how you defeat that in yourself is you didn't pay attention to how they defeated you, allowed you, allowed you to defeat yourself. It's about a status you've set up. And it's about a status you buy into when you just start agreeing to do what they say. And it's because we live in a world that wants immediate re- justification for what we're going to do it will, or a satisfaction for what we're going to do, and we don't prepare ahead. If you're going to travel about the country here, you're going to need to deal with the TSA if you want to be free. I, To my mind, this migrant thing is perfect example that it's there and you can do it. You're just going to have to take the steps in order to make it so. You do that. Again, you've got to look in that mirror. Is it we? No, it's one of you. So you set up an impossibility there, and then you set up a violation of under the Constitution, and their policy starts to have to fall silent pretty quickly. And what you have to do is research enough 
that you find how that works. And periodically through this broadcast, I tell you. And I don't do it in such a way that you might think that there's a direct road map so that you, you get yourself in trouble. There's a little bit of knowledge around what I'm talking about. I hope you feel that when I'm talking. Like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You don't know that. You need to go find it. It's there. Find out the statuses. You find out there's lists and states about how the status is created. Have you taken steps to eliminate that? If you haven't, then you're going to be having evidence they can track down in order to put you in the status that you can't be that migrant. I don't see a problem with migrant, actually. Well, you want to talk about illegal? What if you're a legal migrant? What if you're lawful in what you do? How does it get better than that? Where are your rights, folks? Did you just give them up? Did you get overwhelmed with all you thought you, you knew? Did you did you get overwhelmed with how much they wanted to have you know that they don't want to tell you the truth about? Or did you get uh, the silence that you didn't hear them not talking about when they only speak about one thing and it doesn't really answer your question? Do you get all, all triggered because you're going to have to do something to protect yourself against that intrusion? Yeah, most of us do. I don't like doing any of it, but... I'm sure finding out when you do address that and you get the proper view, they have little, if no, if any, discussion. And so, what is the problem with migrants moving about the country without documentation? I was just blown away, actually, that I didn't see a whole bunch of free-minded people saying, great, how can I do the same thing? And then saying, well, that must mean that I'm an occupied people because I can't. Have you ever thought about it that way, folks? I've been here doing this, what, over 10 years now. I've been talking and writing a lot longer than that, trying to explain to people. And I, I get crickets now every week because I can't get y'all to do anything else. And yet the answers are right in front of us. This notice to us is that migrants can fly without proper documents. You don't want to prepare, you don't want to give your papers, give your papers when they demand. Don't have any. But you're going to have to prove it. How do you do that? That's your study. And how do you do that? You sit down and every night, you dedicate some time and you start researching down, taking what I say as a lead and go track down for you what the truth is where you are. Not we, you. Like I said, unless that's me, myself, and I, the we that you see when you look in the mirror. But it's each one of us. And I can't, I cannot make those decisions for you. I can just implore you to do the proper thoughts and get the proper knowledge and start looking at the news the way you really ought to. And I think, I don't see the thing, I know. When you see migrants fly without proper documents, you ought to want to be a migrant. Not hard to kick that illegal term off of it, and I'd be a lawful migrant. Maybe I just said something in the word migrant you need to understand, too, to get around something else. Okay, another that's another nugget. Because it gets you in a mindset. When you start seeing what this is about, you start getting the mindset. You start to see different. And it's not easy. These people are occupiers. They don't want to let you go free. But when they come down to the brass tacks of it, their policy, they couldn't keep people from moving around. And so I'll move on. Uh, there was a comment to this, and thank you very much. Talking about, and I, this was imp important to uh, go through. To that, I got one one response to that, in looking at it, with his, uh, which was from uh, Break This News. And I appreciate the response. It, these responses allow me somehow when I get uh, if I get some time to kind of look and see how do we respond because be careful not to put ourselves into uh, lulling ourselves into inaction I guess is the way I, I look at it the response was if today's law is interpreted as policy quote policy enforcement as it seems to be more and more then then I'll say then whatever the policy is is carried out by unconscious minions just following orders and John Q and John Q is ill equipped to dissent. And this is where I was bringing up the dissent before in my mind that triggered on I, I triggered on this one was dissent. It's not enough just to dissent. It's not enough just to withhold asset. That's all dissent means. And I answer this that way. If policy and uh, the minions that carry it out and John Q is ill equipped, well John Q 
Jane Q and uh, Q and nonsense all are ill-equipped generally. But the problem I see with this look here is not a problem more than observation. Yes, all that's true that the minions will, the unconscious minions will impose upon you all the Q, which is not good. In fact, the question says that to dissent. It's not enough just to dissent. Now, this is like withholding consent. It's not the same thing. You, that's not all. All of that doesn't work. So anybody been focused on this stuff, you're not understanding the condition, the state, the status, the presumptions of that, and then how. So you don't even know to, to address it first of all, but then you don't even know secondly to where to begin. And you won't get that until you start doing the things I'm asking you to do for yourself. But I respond to that question. If today's law is interpreted as policy enforcement, as it seems to be more and more than whatever, than whatever the policy is, is carried out by unconscious minions just following orders, and John Q is ill-equipped to dissent. And I say yes, but it's not an if, nor merely to dissent, and more the reason people need to get behind the woodshed. Then I add, they won't, but they need to. Let's go back to the point of the policy. That's the point. They're operating administratively on policy that may not meet the law. And the law isn't what you, oh, I've got this right. It's the law that you can find is da written down that you identify as your authority in the documentation that they have to recognize. Not what you say, but in the documentation that they recognize. And this is the thing that people quite have a, they get triggered on. Oh, it means I got to agree with it. No, it's how the, you communicate. It's like talking to a, a foreign agent in a foreign land. You better, you better have a translator. And in, in order to translate this, you have to have a little bit of a decoder ring, which I provide here most uh, for in, in, in the surface area, in the surface of it. I can provide how this all seems, well, it seems to work because we, we work against it in the ways I'm telling you and we get traction. So that's the point. This is not that the law is interpreted as policy. It is policy, and the policy is as law. As law. Not the law. As law. It's like you're as money. Fiat is as money. Not money. Not specie, but as money. It follows the, it follows this imposition of fiat that you're, the occupation that you're under. And so they deal in policy. This is no different than alternative dispute resolution offering alternatives to your way of life that you, they'll want you to buy in. That's not law. That's even one step down. That's just a suggestion. Policy is the uh, def um, deferential, correct, differential law, as the uh, interpreted by an agency doesn't mean it's law. And it isn't law, and they, they apply these policies as a general application. You have to find yourself just outside of that. And then you show you have another uh, focus, another foundation that they violated. This is no different. I'll apply it even now. One more point. You got policy, administrative law, and your executive. You have the alternative dispute resolution alternatives that they want you to buy into. And then we have international law that says the very same thing. They can only apply to you that the laws they can change over time, they can apply, but those they can't, you have right to go through. And they have to regard, as I show you in the law, land law, things called savings clauses. They're everywhere. You'll find them as provided that, or notwithstanding, or the saving club, pro, the, the prohibition is constrained by this, or controlled, or whatever they're saying. They, they show you in a very short clause right up front, or in the middle, or at the end, you'll look at the little clause that says that you can do all this, but don't touch that part. And I'm saying that's where you jump in. You identify that part. When the policy is enforced, it may not meet the law. You have to find that part. Uh, let me see if I can make it less esoteric. It'll be still esoteric because most of you don't have a clue about it. The way the Forest Service applies its rules. Not, well, not, not only did we destroy those, we didn't do it. On our, on our request to Small Business Administration advocacy, advocacy stepped in and destroyed the Forest Service's ability to promulgate the 228 rules. The 228s are what they try to put under miners to do plans of operations, which we've also found is not applicable. No, no one wants to understand this, but that's you go read the law, and that's what it says. And so none of our guys do, do any of that. But the rules were promulgated wrong because they violated the law, and another we got another agency to identify that. And so the rules they're using today are not even promulgated laws, the rules. 
because the rules didn't actually implement what the law was to do and specific to that. Now, we didn't have any direct way to go at it, but we found within the subject matter an agency that could. Is the kind of tactics and strategies I'm telling you to uh, to look in and you won't know about until you get involved. So we attack their policy, their policy rule. And they we, they we destroyed the whole thing. They're still using it, but no one knows, you know, not enough people know to stop it. See, and that's the other problem. Only five of us know this. The rest of the mining community could care less. They want to go just be milked by a, an illegal, a, an attorney, instead of looking at what the law says and say, and then saying, well, but you don't have a rule, a lawful rule to apply. Because the policy that you're operating under has no substantiation. It didn't meet the law. It was there, but it didn't meet the law. In this case, the 228s weren't even promulgated lawfully, so they didn't go through the process that they had to be to be giving deference by a court. And so we just took that and said, well, if a court can't give it deference, we don't have to either. And that's our first less letters out. And you can do the same thing with the TSA. Once you establish this, ask the question, why does a migrant travel without papers? And then you just say, okay, why does an illegal migrant travel without papers? And my first question to you is, why didn't you ask, why didn't you want to be a migrant, illegal or illegal? Not legal. Or not or non, non-legal at all. No, do you get in the hype about, oh, these people don't have papers? Look, at you see the mind control there? Instead of saying, well, I want to be a migrant. Do you want to be a migrant, folks? That anybody's going to say no? Some of you might. And if I'm, if you say no, I'd, I'd like to be a migrant. Maybe not, forget the illegal, but I want to be the migrant because those migrants don't have to travel with papers. Now we got you on the path. And if that it rises up to an interest to you, I want you to jump, grab it with both hands and, and, or jump on it with both, ride it like a, a funky bronc, whatever. Jump on it and make that the wrong you need to make right against you. And when you do that for you, because it's such a general application, you're working for others, which is an equity principle that uh, you comply just by jumping in. You, you also comply with that. And so you go to make your record. You, you make yourself look like the migrant, not illegal, the legal migrant. You can't have the documents because to do so would be a fraud or to do so would defeat, defeat existing rights that they have to honor. And you do these by the congressional authorities as well. I can't believe that's a harder answer than what I hear, well, not doing nothing, or what I hear going on in all the, the confetti that goes on about people that think that talk about how much they know. It, it doesn't make sense to me to do it any other way when I see the path so, so clearly straight. The problem is the formality it seems to be an obstruction to people. In this case, the TSA is pretty straightforward. The, the courts have said, you have to deal with the TSA administratively. I say, good, do it. It's not. There's no judicial consequence there. And so we have a little bit of glimpse. Migrants can move without the papers. We want your papers. Well, the migrants don't have to have them. Why don't you make yourself look like a migrant? Isn't that much what I said? If you complain about the elites having offshore accounts, and may, they're may wealthy, what, what's your gripe? Why don't you just go become an elite and have an offshore account? Do it right. Why don't you go offshore? Go to like a place like Nevada. Maybe Delaware, maybe one of 15 other states that allows you to do the really interesting offshore type accounts where you're covered up uh, the nested Russian nested dolls and you, you cover up your operations. Like instead of complaining, go learn how to do that if that's what, if that's what you want to do. I looked into it. It didn't, it didn't interest me after a while. I had other things I wa- apparently I want to do and then the mining law thing came up and I said, well, this is a little more foundational, more organic to me. And because if I'm in, if I stay outside of commerce, they, they, there's no attachment either, except the corruption, the occupation, the mis, well, it's just corruption. I don't know what else to say. It's the violation of underlying law, which is objective, not your opinion. That's the main thing I can, I can see always. Just stay on the objective side. The things that you can just copy and paste right out of the code, you go so much faster and cleaner. You don't go into long-winded histories about what's going on. When I talk about someone trying to interfere with a product, a patent land, I just cite the statute that says that they can't. And if they're an administrative agency, I just cite their contested case site that said they don't have the authority high enough to touch it. And what have I done? I've just destroyed their policy. I did it with the statute, which is not even law. But that's refl- that's respecting a law. 
The law happened to be the disposal and the evidence that they're not supposed to touch. That's the law. And that savings clause that keeps them from touching it is the acknowledgement of that. And so understand, again, you have these different positions that need to be understood. And this is not just legal nonsense. This is how we've established how we keep our stuff from being taken. And if you don't know that, then you're just someone who is selling to everybody else the ability to have their stuff taken. And being as confused as you are, I suppose. Our other problem that rides on this, that obscures that a little bit, is that we're in such a corrupt condition, and we haven't had enough people being able to call it out because they don't make the record right to be able to prove it in such short steps. And that's what I try to do. Not many people are agreeing with it. As I said, people need to get behind the woodshed. They won't, but they need to. And I mean get behind the woodshed. Not Again, we're not going behind the woodshed. We're getting the principles that you, we ought to have not lost or we should have gotten to bring someone else behind the woodshed that's been doing the wrongs. And so get behind the woodshed. Get what I'm saying here. It's not hard to understand. Anybody who decides it's hard to understand is lazy or, or is trying to sell a, sell you down the river. And that's not... They would let you want to buy, give you some uh, 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 an easy out to to a situation that's not easy, and it wasn't meant to be. But you are in put into if you have any idea you want to be free. Otherwise, you're just talking and doing nothing, just just doing nothing. You're not contributing a little bit either. And as I said, I see more. It's just noise. That's what this whole social media thing is. Just a bunch of noise. I'm amazed at what's coming down. That they're saying, oh, you can't, uh, oh, we're knocking out, we're purging all these people. Yeah, that's not a good thing, but we'll go make your own platform. For, not, stop this nonsense stuff about being subject to somebody else. I don't know when this broadcast is going to get knocked out. But see, I don't, I don't get on to the ad money. I, I just I saw that coming years and decades ago. Before I even understood about the internet or found a place to get on. And even that for me was a little bit hard. But anyway, it, it happened. So here I've been. Another two other networks back. But I never was on the monetization stuff. That was a major trap. And I just in my life I've just seen nothing but money messes people up. Coming or going, you or them, it just messes stuff up. And I said, listen, if I got a message, it's going to have to go out because I can do it. And, and people are, have been gracious enough to provide things to me that will allow me to do it. Do I need the money? As money? Even, even the fiat? Sure I do. But will I do anything to attach? Absolutely not. I don't do a lot of stuff on the Internet just because of all that. If it ends, it ends. I go find something else. The Internet's not over. Everyone's talking about, oh, the, the age of free speech is over. No, it's not. That's you're giving up. You're making, you're, you're telegraphing that to other people so they give up. And yet there's so much opportunity. Do I have a lot of people that follow this broadcast? No. I had a lot more before. But that's to me, is indicative of the seriousness of our, of our dire straits. No, I'm not talking about rock music. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to take this migrant? Why do migrants get to travel around the country without documents? It's really interesting. I smiled when I saw that. I said, well, here's something I'm going to talk about. This is important. This is something, if I can get people to understand and they start to see this, you can apply this to anything, actually. But if they get to see this, for those of you that want to have a right to thrive, you got to reorient your thoughts and then see that, that you have a right to travel if you're a migrant without documents. And the government can't give an answer, and I say they won't give the answer because then they'll tell you the truth. And part of that truth is find it not being the status that you can get those documents in the first place. Then you create the impossibility. Their policies can't match that impossibility, and you still have the need and right to travel now. What are they going to do? You gonna give me an answer in your mind? Did you answer that in your mind? Did that now that you hear, oh, that's an interesting thing. Let's move on to the next breads and circuses in your mind to do. Or are you gonna say, well, that makes a good point. I'm doing something in my life that makes me look like a somebody that's not a migrant, somebody that's free. 
Remember, these people don't belong, if I can say the word belong here, they don't belong in the jurisdiction. And there's ways that you belong in a jurisdiction. And all y'all can put in your mind all your guilt about all the documentation that's in the world that confesses away your ability to be non-dependent on it all. You go ahead and do that if you want. Or you can take on the, a strict uh, innocence position and force everyone to start forcing the, the application of a status on you. As long as you're, as long as you're innocent and there's no document that, that's been created, how are they going to do that? It's all about documents and evidence. It's such 15 documents, folks. And someone gets to travel without it. You need to go inquire about the underpinnings of that. Don't think, don't go ask the TSA. They're not going to give you the answer. They're going to give you a bunch of nonsense. Go find out why. And now you'll be a lot closer to where you want to be for all y'all. I think you want a right to travel, right to drive, and all this other stuff. It's there to see how did a my illegal migrant travel without documents is should be an answer to you. And if you don't see that, I don't know what to say all these years. You should be, uh, again, why weren't more people enthused about seeing that? In fact, the, le the article was condemnatory. How come they get to travel without documents and we don't? That's a pretty pathetic opinion. What a victim. What do I, I come along to it. Wow, there's, there's evidence. Evidence of free, being free. Just move about the country without my papers. I don't have any. I can't get any. Now what? Now, I wouldn't end just there, but that's the, that's the nubbins of it. There's, I like to stack, I like to stack my, my positions so that if they break through one or they have a stupid, even a stupid answer, they're going to have to answer the tougher one. And after about the second one, the third one, they start realizing it's going to get tougher and tougher. They stop. And so, we've been told, within the United States, we have to go through administrative, uh, uh, an administrative condition. You're seeing the illegal migrant has to do that, but when the illegal migrant, the migrant comes through, they don't have any papers to give. They still move about the country. Then there's going to be, a, when you read that story, there's also something about heightened security. You have to attack that while you're doing that as well, where you, again, you, you find how, what authority they have to take away your innocence. And you put that in administrative context. In other words, you throw that practicability. They're going to throw on you that it's national security. And you say, that didn't mean you could destroy my innocence. And so there's going to be a little bit of a discussion on that in record written down that you need to do. And there is in all this stuff. Do I like it to do that? No. But this is telling you, because you have to, you live in an occupied country, folks. Just get it over it. The migrant had to go through it, and he gets out without papers. You go through it, you end up having to have all these papers, and the servitudes, and the connections, and the record that they can manipulate and attach. And so, you know, I'm moving on. So moving on to this idea of giving up information, and then you create the statuses uh, that they can track you down on, and you get into systems that they can then adjust so that they can tell you that you can't move about the country, you can't enter, engage in the commerce of conversation. Understand, I told you that they did that. They put this, the marketplace of ideas should have told you the Supreme Court wasn't on your side. This all happened after, you know, like the 32 stacking packum of the, of the Supreme Court moving this into the more ad, ad, administrative condition that has on it these constraints that you need to go find for yourself. For you, what do we do? No, you, what do you do is the question you ask, not me. Go stare in the mirror for a little while while you're kind of asking the we question and keep focusing on the fact that the one who has to answer is the one that's in that mirror. Yeah, that virtual image. And then you got to attach that to yourself eventually. The creative little monkeys that we are in our brains, we want to do all this evasion. But anyway, so... We have given a cons we've consented against ourselves because we haven't asserted properly the fact that we can't and created the fact that we can't do certain things. We haven't become that migrant. No, we condemn the migrant, not realizing what the migrant's telling us relative to jurisdiction, authority, and powers and administrative impositions. And we forget that, that by doing that, we bring ourselves into the idea that we are censorable. And then we're surprised that that happens, as this is starting to happen 
relative to now it's being focused on this, uh, what is it, the the journalism and, and then social media. You're going to find how much social media is part of journalism and all that kind of thing as they start to knock us down because these statuses and possessions and the open questions that are not resolved because you all just sit back and complain and not really put the challenges out and watch very carefully on how to put a challenge out in 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 certain ways. Uh, but here we go. Now the, the leader of what's going on, here in China, the biggest uh, mass of people that have the biggest control, theoretically the non-state here, <laughs> China, the communism. Now, China bans the Intercept and other news sites in sep- censorship Black Friday. The Chinese government appears to have launched a major new internet crackdown blocking the country's citizens from accessing internet's website and those of at least seven other Western news organizations. Seems to get a lot of press, but they're doing it here in the United States and everywhere else, aren't they? And so this is a global a global attack. I don't care what government you go through, they're all going to do it. And the government subsidiaries, which are these corporations, are all in tow as well. So we've been hearing also a YouTube ban going on. Here's a list of ideas and statements YouTube will ban, ban you for, for expressing under their new hate speech policy. You'll read in this story, you get a link. The Supreme Court says that hate speech is protected. And so the, they're still showing you that they call this hate speech policy. I said, what's policy? Is it applicable or not? Well, there's a question of whether or not these entities are private. I have a problem about uh, censoring private entities, but then I kind of lose that that censorship idea. But you can't tell someone what to do when they open their door to everybody. Like an open, you just open your door. And uh, if you look around, anybody who does that has a different has to be treated slightly different. I say also the infrastructure that they run all this electronics runs on the public easement, and so they they're taking benefit of that public easement. And whether or not they're fully paying for that is a whole other question. But all these things need to be analyzed before you start making a question about it all. If if fighting a private company's policies is something you want to do. Again, that's a different question than just saying, well, they have a right, and then you're going to have to move somewhere else. And so the whole question about this was it seems like a lot of people is trying to bite the hand that was feeding them the monetary thing because this is now based on demonetization, jumping into hate speech policy as a guideline, which they create. What I found interesting about the hate speech policy is it's um, an interesting problem relative to what they refer to other violations th- that is a, a, a vicious circle of, of a lack of actual responsibility in telling you exactly what. And certainly it's no position where they just ban you. Uh, so the censorship is created by you agreeing to get into that. Whether or not you want to fight the right of the privacy for them to do that or on the public way, as I would uh, argue if I was... If it ever happens to me, I'm, I don't know. I'm not that, that invested in it. I've never done this for a buck, so I'm not really, I'm not really, there's no nobody that pays pays me. I'm grateful for Grimner and the website and being able to be here and do this, and then your donations, that's how I'm here. It, it's irrelevant. I get, go to our YouTube, we get hardly anybody clicking in there. Who cares? I mean, it's, I get better bit and bit shoot. Thank you very much. I get better, better hap, hitting, hitting on the bit shoot. And bit shoots now, I guess, 5,700, it's the 50, 5,700th uh, website now. It's getting quite a bit of coverage. I only get my 50 to 100 a, a week, but that's 50 or 100 more than I'm getting well well better than the RLM YouTube site. So do you want to even fight that? Or do you just want to make, do people want to get together and promote themselves elsewhere? And why aren't you promoting the places that you want? Why don't I see more thumbs up and comments and and all that kind of stuff. Why don't I see more integration like I see in other places is also indicative. I kind of take a step back and I see why we're a society as screwed up as we are. I see why this becomes more bread and circuses. They want to have a hate speech policy. And my thought would be to go after, just to make a point of it, go after how in how lack of, of actual objective basis it is. Just to, just to actually a setup for the takedown the other way. And don't 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 worry. Why do you get money and then complain that they're not giving you money on their rules? I've never understood that. But see, I'm, I'm not wired that way. It doesn't matter to me. And so I don't see. I'm not sympathetic to the part of this and this condition. 
Of, of course, it's an insanity, so of course it makes no sense. I mean, so what's the point there? You either try to make something, force something in, make it work, make it open for people, when the, find a way to make it open for when people, the op uh, website opens itself up to membership without constraints. Now, I don't mean their policy being a constraint. I'm talking about relative to the, when the, when a, when they're recognized as a public forum, now maybe we, we attach that First Amendment. But if it's not, and they could do it very simply, then it's not. And I don't, there's a subtle, maybe a semantic about that. I don't know, do, would people still sign up to Facebook if they had to have a, a more of a contractual attachment? Do we add the fact that you, if you're going to keep it private, you have to provide a consideration to maintain the privacy? Maybe we consider that. And anybody who's free and open like that, maybe not. You're a public forum. Like Twitter was announced would be a public forum. Someone tested that. And the president being on the, I don't know if people appreciated this, the president being on Twitter made that a public forum. I don't know if anybody's going to take that and run with it about Twitter. And I don't know where it's going to go. We still are in the corruption of the courts. But we would at least start causing people to think in more substantial foundational ways than just a passing thought. See, that's the other thing. We do this passing thought nonsense on the Twitter sphere and all this other thing, and we don't go do more behind it. It means, really means nothing. It's the memory hole concept, isn't it? So we have a list here. Here's a list of ideas and statements. Ideas and statements that are banned. Well, you look at the list, and a few of them are just impossible. I mean, there's, they're just impossibilities relative to what most people do anyway, so they're not active. But then they throw out the, the general net uh, uh, catch-all. Uh, well, you just violated a policy, and that seems to bring people up, and no one challenges that. Instead, I see a lot of people railing about the horror of censorship. Oh, and then you hear the bottom line. Oh, my bottom line is being affected. Well, stop making it your bottom line, first of all. And if you're going to get paid, you have to have a, a condition that you're going to meet. If you don't like that they're doing that, don't participate. If you don't like that they do it, but you can argue that it's a public forum, that they didn't have a right, their policy exceeded what the the forum was right to do under what you might be able to assert, that's a different position. You can't complain openly about that. You have to go address the private party uh, directly. And so, I, again, just do we complain or do we make a big... Everyone's being sensational about the fact that they're actually used as political forums. Come on, get up, grow up, get over it. Of course, they're political forums. Did we? Uh, I would have never guessed that they were this integrated about how they work it. I'm not. I'm not wired about organized. I'm not an organized criminal, though. You know, crime boss here. So I don't. I don't know how they work this out. You get a better idea, like you get Clint Richardson's uh, work on Corporation Nation, and you start seeing how it's all integrated on the financial side and the control. Uh, that way, how everybody's incestually, and then you start seeing it. I mean, now what's the big? Now what's the other point? Why haven't more people read corpor uh, watch Corporation Nation? Why the surprise? Why the continued uh, uh, noise? Is it right? No, it, I don't think it's right. But, but at some point, are you going to do more than complain? And if you're not, move on, and then promote yourself wherever. Tim Pool. Left-wing media activist email leak shows how they deplatform political rivals. This upped the Andy a little bit. Tim Pool is a guy that's on YouTube. I guess he's well liked and all that other stuff. I wanted to contact him on a couple points. Wanted him to, but I just don't have the time to deal with uh, what's going on. Uh, at least in my mind, I don't know what it would take uh, to try and inform him on a couple things. He has a following. He could be telling people his uh, the, some of the things he likes. I could contribute to him. But I just haven't had the time to how to work out that with the way the direction that a lot of this stuff goes uh, is real difficult for me to really uh, to have a thought about. But he brings up an email link that shows how the deep, how the rivals deplatform politics. If you read this email, it's very interesting uh, to watch how people, uh, so-called left-wing media activists, uh, again, I, I think those are just labels that that kind of cover things as well, but. We have a direction, I suppose, we can kind of lean, but we can show our distinction if we are, or our com our compatriotism if we are, to the word left. Uh, that uh, they talk about uh, this one, woman, April, sent a letter to Chase relative to some uh, some websites, uh, the Chase Payment Program. 
uh, to question, now she's supposedly doing this as a journalist, to question Chase's support and, and processing about that at all. But she mentions a, a Soviet uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. They showed in this email how an influence could be done from a so-called journalist that uh, works against a corporation who's providing money to impose the stakeholder threat. As I tell you, the stakeholders are like Genghis Khan on your door, and then he's got his horde standing behind him, and he says, would you let me in? And you know if you don't, it won't matter. And this is the kind of thing, this is a stakeholder. This is really a criminal in my mind about how they did this. And they tried to cover it up over her being a journalist. To me, it's more important the tactic they use that if you want to get into this war, why don't you just do the same? And eventually you're going to you're gonna watch the whole of the Internet be destroyed and there will be no monetization anyway if, you all, if you're as creative on the right like with your memesterisms and you started to address this like the left is doing, this, we, we would burn down the Internet relative to payments because everybody can be viewed in a certain way with all this SJW stuff as a, some hater and we can just burn down the Internet, at least the monetization of the Internet. Now, for me, I don't care. Let's do it. But if, if you're going to make a complaint, make a decision. Strategize whether or not that's involved uh, in something that you you need to do or not, or move on. Uh, so this is interesting. Uh, it shows an email of how the, uh, the stakeholder uh, creates himself as a stakeholder to become Genghis Khan, to develop that mental horde against a corporation that doesn't want to be caught. Not that they're doing anything wrong, but because of the way the story's framed, and they just don't have the ability to undo that. No, I'm not supportive of Chase. I mean, they're they're a major a major tool, if not weapon, if not uh, implementer uh, of this whole thing. So it's not about that either. So you understand, it's about looking at what's going that dynamic. Do you want to adopt this? I I would say maybe you should consider it. What's the problem? If the whole if you're not going to monetize one part, let's not monetize any of it. If you really want to get serious, otherwise, what's the story here? You just see people doing their darndest in order to uh, harm and hurt people. That's what that's what this internet has become. It's just this big tool for harm. No one, no one, well, everybody, and everybody wants to get in the in the pitch battle either. Also, probably likely why I only got a couple hundred people that come around the Twitter or or the, or the FN network or the minds and minds. I got just a handful of people. But behind mines, you see a whole bunch of nonsense going on as well. I don't see a difference, a distinction between all these places. They're all in it for their game, and they're all in it for getting you to plug in. And I'm real resistant to that. It may be to my own detriment. I have so many people saying, why don't you go here, go to a better network, go this, go do that. Well, if going doing things more than what I'm doing is a lot of time that I may not have, actually. But, but I've looked at some of this stuff. Is it really advantageous? Do I get more people doing? Well, I don't know that I do. And so I rely on you all in order to help promote the ideas to stop become, being whiners, stop putting the responsibility on we. You take responsibility on something you want and take my lead, if you will, to start the thing, if I talk about it, to go do something about the harms that you do. I actually, when I think about that, looking at what they do, again, I'm not an organized criminal mind. I'm not a crime boss. I would have never gone to thought about writing a letter to Morgan Chase to go after a couple people and their funding. I don't, I'm not in it. It's, I'm not that guy. I could care less. I don't. If you want to do it, do it. I don't want to go after undercutting. But there's people out there that will. You want to raise your game to meet them. You're going to have to follow what they do and get more creative than that. So you can complain. You could say, oh, we have leaked. Leak. Stop. I just clickbait. And, and I guess another thing I, I just saw Tim Poole put out, he's talking about there's a lawsuit against Google and it's been allowed to go to discovery. He was sensationalizing that too much. So not to dismiss Tim Poole, what his work is, but see, we get into this sensational thing. I'm not really into that either. And that's not going to drive, that's not going to drive clicks. I can only, I can tell you that. And then I, and then people come and listen and can't get me in five seconds, and so they're gone. I mean, it's just the way that works. And those of you that hang in there longer, you, you're picking up things, and, but most of you just uh, you agree, but you're not really active, at least to the point that you need to be, or I see you need to be, relative to things that are out there. And then a lot of you are older. I mean, we're all, you just, who cares at some point? You know, big deal, let it pass, right? I mean, that's what's in us. But I don't know. I've made the decision that I'm going to work with my colleagues who are older uh, than me as well, 
the, we're we're knocking them we're knocking them down. It takes a long time, but we're still doing something. Is it to do with internet deplatforming? No, we could care less about all that. I'm grateful to the access that I have. If I don't have it, it won't stop me tomorrow. Maybe the the interference of the entire internet, yes. But during the week, I'm talking. I'm trying to you know communicate with people. We're, I'm writing stuff. We send it to the internet. Uh, I do the you know one bulk send to someone through an email. We'll try and get on some uh, discussion in a, commu- in a in a communication device. Uh, that is interesting. Every time I try to get in communication with someone through a phone, a system, a VoIP, they, we have problems. And I haven't figured out why. Everyone's got a different problem. It's been very difficult. And to pick a good VoIP is has become much more difficult as far as the security features. And so I can only tell you, working more through the Internet, it's really a convenience to do that. But my work is done focused on projects and doing documents because that's what you communicate in. And it's not into, I could care less about the deplatforming stuff. They want to kick me off of a place that won't stop my work because I'm doing something else. It's not my world. Will it hurt about getting the word out? Yes, it always will. But that's not the world either because if, again, I don't, if I, div- if I disappeared tomorrow, would anybody really care? I mean, some of you might. I appreciate all that, but really, I'm just going to be, I'll just fade off into the, into the ether net, won't I? Because if you're not listening now to do anything, you don't care. You're just going to look at the next breads and circuses. Some of you will really miss what maybe I'm contributing, but are you doing something with it? So uh, it's not, I'm not too invested in some of this. I certainly can see where we need to be doing better. I need to be doing better. Uh, I guess I could anticipate doing more. Yes, I guess I could have gotten in cryptocurrency and doing that and having people donate through that for what little bit we would get. It would be more than what I'm getting, but it's just not a focus for me. And because it's not a focus, I'm not invested. But if you're going to make the investment and you're going to do that, you better be willing to defend that more than just a complaint. It doesn't matter that someone wrote a letter to Chase to deplatform some people. That's the reality. It won't matter because they're not going to go back and say, wait a minute, but this is the same thing in reverse. And maybe outing the Southern Poverty Law Center. And going back and starting to show where all these corporations that can do this don't have the right to do that to people based on a stakeholder letter. And you all may not even understand what I just said about how this dynamic works. I tell you, it's everywhere. It's how the world works right now. And if you don't have it understood, you'd rather, I just know, you go to complaining, you think leaking, uh, finding a leak, something or rather, is the answer. And it just may give people a heads up, but nothing's going to come of it. Until something comes of it, see, that's the whole point. You got to do. So there's been an attack on this, uh, on, on on just communication, on what we might call journalism, on people. Whistleblowers have been attacked for years. This is just the ongoing attack by governments generally. Corporations, remember, your governments were started by corporations. Okay, mostly for a lot of them from the crown themselves. We're talking about the colonies that stretched out. So you see, this is just a big old business deal. Why they held commerce as control to them in the constitutions. And this little anomaly called property interests, the property rights, just it blows me away. That's the little thing we have to hold on to. And no one really wants to understand that very better. And so when you own a thing, you control a thing. Uh, if you're on a platform and you're not control, you're not owning it. You're not controlling it. That's all. Control is possession. That's it. Nine tenths, they tell me. So you can again, we can argue about all this. Yes, I don't like seeing that uh, someone became a stakeholder and shut down someone else from talking. That that can't be good. But are you going to whine more about it? Are you going to become, look at me, the victim? Or are you going to turn around and use all your your listenership to coalesce something to go after that? Or just start your own stuff? And stop, just stop whining about it. I don't know why you want to make and waste time about it if you're not going to follow through. So, again, media is under attack. It's been under attack. We've been hearing it coming. Australian federal authorities raid even more journalists over leaked documents. So we got leaking going on everywhere. And yet, and the governments are coming back. And so it's all the way to Australia. Australia got uh, got scary in a hurry 
Now, one day after raiding the home of News Corp Australia journalist Annika Smethford Thirst over the publication of leaked documents detailing the government's domestic surveillance plans, the Australian Federation, Federal Police raided ABC News Australia over leaked documents detailing the killing of unarmed civilians by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. Boy, a lot of details in here. We won't go through it. If you're that interested, you go look. You go look if you think you're a journalist of what they do. They took one leaked document. They attacked one journalist, uh, journalist company, and then they went after another. So they're gaining information as they do this to start picking up this big net. And I, I don't, you know, the, the thought about this is that there's certainly the governments are after media to control them more. And this is all done under national security. So this is, these things are going to be kind of interesting to watch. And you need to understand how the parsing line about what their rights are to do this versus the rights of the press. Okay, so this is a very a serious kind of a thing moving down relative to what people what is being promoted as journalism. Even MSM is being attacked. But look at what they're doing. Look at what happens. And you kind of see what goes on globally, why certain media in different countries doesn't speak against the government. Now, that should start to concern you, but then why would it be a, a big big deal? Why is it big sensational news that we see MSM comporting to the government power that it can hurt it? Why, it, it makes, why, come, why do we talk about it anymore? You need to change your focus. Like I said, the only thing I can see about some of this, understand what they're doing on the big boys, and you need to turn around and do something local so that you get something done. Because we can stand and watch all this stuff go on and on, and it won't ever do anything. And Because, well, if we're not doing something ourselves, then we're not under the threat. We're allowing what we witness is wrong to continue. But So journalism is telling us that for us in America with the press rights, that Australia is willing, supposed to be a democracy, it's a democratic monarchy, that they're utilizing the national security to come after a press you should be a little alarmed about how this works. And moving from that into the ongoing saga, which, again, I don't know how much all this stuff is the psyops that are, you know, the, the false flag type things where they're doing this as a setup to break down other things and make inroads to certain areas otherwise to get really at more of the population. We're going back some time now to remind us of Chelsea Manning and and uh, was it Brad Brad Manning, Bradley Manning, and Julian Assange are in jail. History chem trembles. This is the concept that's coming down. This is the story that came out a long while back about the history trembling relative to this. Now, it's true at one level, but I wonder how much of this is a story. We have to start becoming more aware of the deceptions, uh, and then choose where we're going to uh, we're going to where we're going to go, and be careful of what we support and how. The invasion is not a good thing. If this is not a setup, then history trembles. If this is, history is going to tremble, but it's going to be for a, re a different reason. Uh, tonight, both Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange are in jail, both over offenses related to publication of material specifying U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, and both charged with nothing else at all. This is consistent with the Australian news, uh, Australian federal police invading the news, normal news, news agencies. So we now see a, a combining. This is not just not Julian Assange and the, and the NSA and all that. This is actually out there. The mainstream media is consistent with something that's happened in Afghanistan that they don't really want out. And so I'm not sure what that is, and I don't know what it means. More than we already know is an abomination, and not only Obama's nation, but the, even the continuing one around the world, what the United States does, and the and the coalition. I don't know what is being exposed there that they want to cover up. So there's something to brew, but it's attacking journalism. It's attacking your, it's a censorship, if you will. Again, it's just not in the YouTube. It's just not in any of the social media. It's across the board at this point. And a story back when as well, Ecuador turns to Interpol to arrest former foreign minister and Assange, the supporter uh, Patino. The fact that they used Interpol to go after someone in Ecuador who purportedly supported a journalist. 
again, they get this information and they start, as you hear in the United States, they just keep rolling up charges and rolling out anybody that they can. Well, I've been telling, I'm telling you how to address a lot of that. I guess Vince easily, easily is the, 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 being such a close party to be a witness in the case of the, of the Bundy condition, but not being rolled up into the charges is a, is a testament to him paying attention to how to be very close to something, but not get involved to the point that you get, je- become jeopardized by the condition of this ever expanding snowball a tempest that the government will put up around you. So we're looking at the, it's indicative of the a raid on a, a pre, what supposed we thought was press secure on a, on a multi mainstream media. They used the information to go after another one. Same thing here earlier with Assange. It was like telegraphing. They went after a supposed supporter of Assange. It's coming out that he really didn't, but that doesn't matter. I told you they're going to make you a criminal if they, in order to make a point. Uh, and then this interesting observation, which I even thought myself, and but I don't know if I did it for the same reasons. If this is real, that it's actually an attack, and these people that, and I have to presume this innocence, but except I really have a bad taste in my mouth for the psyop. It's just too much with the same players all the time. And then I've told you my analysis for that is they, the silence. What they don't do that I know is there to do. Not that it would be successful, that when you don't even try, and the opportunity for su- high opportunity for success is there, I really question you and your motives. And it really hangs with me about that. And I have to wonder, why would you not do, at least make a record of the challenge when I know, everybody knows that an appeal is based on what you, what you did in the lower court that got disregarded but was material to your defense or protection or shield in an upper by an upper repeal why you wouldn't put that in the record uh, is really a question for me and so i have questions with lots of people in the news about what's going on and what the real story is and this assange thing is the very same point why aren't they doing things i know are there to do that need to be done why when he went into the extradition hearing did he have nothing to say when it was his burden to give a re an excuse a plausible excuse why didn't he? And this is a subtle problems I have about Assange, but I thought the very same thing when they finally got him out and they did it the way they did it. The question came up within a, on, in Newsweek, no less. Is Julian Assange finally on the path to freedom? Why would I think that too? Because if he does apply all these things, and here's another one for you to remember, the British courts, I think, on three occasions have already determined that the United States penal system is worse than medieval. It's a human rights abuse system. But they have not extradited three people. That I also predicted that they would have to then maybe use Sweden because at that, at that precedent, the UK courts cannot send him to the United States if he was to assert that. Have they asserted that, folks? I would have to say, no, I haven't heard it. If they have, I want to see a link. They have not asserted that point to de- to take away the power up front that the extradition proceeding is viable at all to the United States. But is he on a path? Now that he's out, see, now it goes through the functions. If he does these things, this could be his path to freedom. I found it interesting that within days, this story from Newsweek pops up. My problem is that they talk about like the serious legal and ethical and security issues and they've dissuade you from the technical jurisdictional questions and challenges that need to be going. Like I asked you to do up front in every time, every instance. Find the ability to do it and do it. Put it on record. So was this extraction of a media, a notable media journalist, into custody after being holed up for seven years in an Ecuadorian embassy where he got violated by the president of Ecuador. Uh, remember, he was a citizen of Ecuador and didn't get any constitutional rights whatsoever in this process of moving him from Ecuador to Britain, right there in London. And so they focus this on serious et- legal and ethical things, but they don't do any of the procedural challenges. Is a pa- I think it is a pathway to get him freed, but they're not exercising it. That the 
the story, the question was broached early, early on. It'll probably make the memory hole. But to me, it's coming up today. It's part of this journalism, the censorship, part of the the uh, statuses that we get ourselves into that I've been talking about today. Uh, we have another one here. Sanja's judge is a disgrace to the bench. I want to address this. A former UK ambassador says, I think that's incorrect. As I just said, Assange, here's the title. Assange's, ju- Assange's judge in the, in, in the journalist who's before the government on an extradition case to the United States over some, uh, all we can see is they're trumped up charges there and maybe Trump's behind it. I don't know after he even agreed. They're, they're an expansion of the Espionage Act in ways that I don't even understand. Again, they can just do it. Again, the UK court said that the penal system of the United States is medieval. I don't know what we have to say more, but getting to the point here that someone made the assertion, and this is again the politics behind and the drive to try to exalt this Messiah figure a bit, to try and diminish the government in, I think, an improper way. Again, we have to look through all of this to perfect what the truth ought to be. And I say, look very carefully to the silences for the answer. Assange's judge, again, this is a form of censorship, if you can get this point, okay? This is what, you're being censored every step of the way here on different levels. Assange's judge, a disgrace to the branch. I don't agree. Why? I've said it. I want to reiterate this. Assange was required, the burden was on Assange when they pulled him out as a journalist and as a de, in a defensive mode against the charge, well, he could have applied it to his bail jump as well, but to the first hearing at the, at the, the, oh, darn, the word just slipped from my mind. Uh, when he pulled him out of, out of the country, it just slipped from my mind. Uh, but he, he did not, uh, oh, excuse me, on the bail jump, the judge was not a disgrace when you look at the testimony, even though he was short. The judge does not have enough information against him in the record to be a disgrace because Assange or his attorneys did not present the excuse they needed to, which was his burden. Remember, he's on a, a breached promise. He has to bring the evidence of the good reason why. Whether he could do it or not, I don't know. But he never presented that. How can the judge be a disgrace in that court? I mean, generally judges are a disgrace. But actually on this one instance, how can you say a judge is disgraced just because Julian Assange wasn't released? It is another type of misinformation to people. There's a process. And I keep telling you, you have to speak through that process. And if you don't, Essentially, you see what happened to Assange. It wasn't a disgrace. The judge takes no disgrace. He just says it was his burden, and he failed. And I have to agree. If you have a burden, I would. when I put a burden on a government official, I don't want him to not, not answer. If I file a quo warranto, I want to make sure that burden sticks like the law is supposed to work. And so this, you got to be careful. We got to be careful on looking at this. I wasn't agreeable, even though I would, I'm generally agreeable the courts are corrupt. I can't be disagreeable with the courts of the UK finding that the United States penal system is a medieval, inhumane system. I can't disagree with that. And so to that part, they're right. I don't necessarily know if I agree that they have the authority that they do to do some of these things, but I'm not here for that. I'm here to identify whether or not we're being played as well. And we need to look in to see what a better word in our mouth would be if it is. If you walk in and believe the judge was a disgrace because he didn't find Assange should be released on whatever, you miss the procedural thing and you'll reflect that failure in that perception in everything you do. What I try to tell you not to do. So I I keep repeating the title because I thought I don't have to go for it. Assange's judge is a disgrace. I don't think so here. Not where the burden was on someone to, to respond. I, as a plaintiff, do not want the defendant that I'm suing for a harm they've done me to be able to not answer and just walk away. This is the rule of how a case gets advanced. The burden is on the answer, and the answer has to come. It could be in a defense, could be in an avoidance, but it's still a response. Julian Assange went into this hearing. It's been presented as a journalistic attack on journalism, a censorship, and I'm asking you, is it really 
And was the judge truly a disgrace when having the burden Assange said nothing? And I'll, I'll repeat myself if I continue. I hope the point is made. We've got to be very careful on what the notice to us is and how to parse through how this is going to work. Do I think that they're mistreating Assange? Absolutely. Did they do it in that hearing? Absolutely not. Was Assange derelict in his duty at that point? Yes, he was. Does that make condemn him? No, it doesn't, but that's not the point at the moment before the court. That wasn't the question. The question was, do you have an excuse? And he stayed mute, M-U-T-E. He was silent on that point, that he had to have an answer. You, at some point, may too. You have to answer that. Well, let's go back to the TSA in the beginning. Are you the status? If you're not the status, do you have an answer? Can you answer? Is the burden on you to answer or not? And if you can't understand this burden flipping, you'll miss that answer. And the answer is, no, you have no burden at all. They have a policy. They have to, sub against what you say you can't, their policy has to have an answer. That's their burden, not yours. And so, not being able to analyze the news, not being able to see what's going on correctly, we can be persuaded against our better interests. And I, again, I'm always trying to find out where that might be. Always trying to find out how we, how maybe I can articulate how to look at this stuff to educate ourselves and how we move this thing forward and how not to get too balled up in a lot of stuff and get wrapped too tight. Take an impartial and neutral view of what's going on. And I'll tell you, I don't know where we're being played and where we're not. And when I have a lot of, a few people that are notorious and not in a good way, I mean, they're known and they will, are in serious potential trouble and they won't take the most basic uh, foundational counsel or advice in what the law says, I have to question them. And I keep wanting to say names, but I'm not going to. In fact, it just came up again. Someone saying, oh, I'm defending myself, this and that and the other, we're going to do this and that. And I'm asking, well, why didn't? Why are you defending yourself against a potentially invalid order? Why haven't you made the record of the question anyway? And if you're not, aren't you then playing into the problem? And you, over time, are allowing the very atrocities we're watching is now global, going across the world, folks. So in our little part, by not responding properly, we let the we let the fire, the conflagration goes and essentially torches the whole world on these per certain points. I guess we analogy we need to be our own little firefighter. San Francisco police chief apologizes for horrifying raid on journalists. That's a big deal, the apology. But we find out it's not truly an apology. And we find then that the, the police unions get involved where this, uh, they arrested this William Scott. Excuse me, uh, William Scott was the chief. And they uh, arrested this Brian Cormody, the freelance journalist. Freelance journalist. If you don't think those of you on the Internet who do blogs and all this discussion aren't considered that, was raided. He was raided because he received information that most journalists get in exposing something about a government official. And then there's an apology after the raid. And then you find the police union jumping in against the, the commander, the, uh, the, the Scott dude, uh, who, who did the apology that, he, that they claim the union, police union, threw the police under the bus. We know the police union is always saying that their police are being thrown under the bus. And we also know the Supreme Court has said uh, you can be too smart and too psychologically stable to be a cop. And I've been telling you, you better go get the right. If you want to keep, live in peace, you better start writing all the policy rules, the policy rules now, because they live and die by those. Live the policy rules relative to re reinforcing the law to keep you peaceful and safe. You're going to need to do that because the occupier will not. The only time that happens is when it raises too high like this, and then you find out you're actually not supposed to attack the press, but they did anyway. See, this is the problem. You have to say, and this guy told you one of the problems in this country, and it's probably right, but it's not really right. It's not justice. You have to suffer the harm first before you even have a chance to go back at it. And they've taken advantage of that because when you go back at it to try and get your remedy, they've made an obstruction to all that remedy, so it's... The lack of obstruction is also the problem of the lack of justice. 
and I mean timely so, and without a lot of hassle. Uh, here we have a cop uh, coming out and apologize for the ra a raid on a journalist. When you watch the dynamics, you have to take note of the dynamic, because any one of you get, uh, that fit into these conditions can be brought into this invasion that you're seeing now is global. Let's go back to Tim Pool. He has a leaked document. Do you think he's now liable? Do you think that there's no scruple against attacking him? Oh, we made a mistake? That's what they, they blame this as a mistake. People die now under these mistakes. What they did to what they did to Julian Assange, or they did to this guy here, Carmody. What they can do maybe to Tim Pool because he leaked somebody, said something. Yeah, leaked somebody. You, you, you don't. Maybe not. You're picking up. You're not picking up how fast this thing is evolving against against us. And for years, I've been telling you you have to address it, otherwise it's going to get worse. And I think we're seeing the very first the very first evidences of this global thing and the reason why your information in this computers are really a weapon against you and why you have to put that in as part of the part of the dynamic again it's not that you're innocent is that someone's going to make you guilty and you haven't situated yourself or understood how to do the right challenges to prove your innocent status and the fraud of impo under color of authority and the felony of imposing one underneath that color of authority. I hope you followed that one. This is just the law. I'm just saying and the law happens to be way far right from everybody in society, apparently. So far right, no one wants to be in it. No one wants to go get behind the woodshed and figure out the most basic, simple stuff. So what, how did they... Tra <laughs> so here comes the... Again, the military consequence was coming up here in this broadcast, I, if you couldn't tell... Uh, again, these cops, are, they, they go, what, the cops go by rank, uh, military ranks, they go by military time, uh, they have military codes, uh, so, I mean, if, you know, it's a, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and swims away fast, fast like a duck, probably the duck, and so I'm going to go, I'd rather go there than to identify a, a duck as, some, as something else. Maybe it's a vorpal duck, and I should be very careful that it might come and pick my eyes out. So if I don't identify it's a vorpal duck, then I'm in trouble. Right? Same thing with these cops. If you don't see their military because of how they how they operate, then you're going to miss a point. Then you're going to miss the connection when you start seeing these stories that armies Google Earth on steroids can look inside buildings. So all this information that you're given to Google and Amazon and all your your Israeli net of things is testifying against you and uh, where they can get, to, eventually it's coming down, where they go after Komodi or whether they go after Assange or everything the army is now pulling together information from Google military contractor, evidently uh, to identify the place you live in and exactly where you are. Didn't we talk about that before on the, using your phones and the uh, Israeli net of things that are on your walls and everywhere to pinpoint where you are well, here's new mapping technology that is expected to transform, transformative future, transform, that's sustainable development, transform, sustainable military oppression, an occupier, transform training and simulation exercises for American war fighters as they unveiled, uh, uh, was unveiled at the IEE Transportation, IEEE -E Transportation Electrification Conference and Expo in May the 15th in Stockholm, Sweden. So here we have technology. I want to read. I was going to read more. It talks about a, pro, a system that the army already has, mapping out your city, your mega mega metros. They've already talked about all this back 20, 30 years ago about how they were making documents on how this would work in the future, and they're getting the information right from the internet and all those things. Those an Israeli net of things like you get the little Roomba, figuring out what your floor plan is. It all just goes into this big uh, database that they just start saying if they want you. They figure out you've been blogging too hard, and they don't like what you've been saying, or you mention that you have a, a leak. They're going to come and fix that leak, folks, and they'll know exactly where you are to do it. And so I say that not to scare you. I say understand the, understand the condition, understand the terrain you're in. This is not a joke, what I've been trying to bring out to you all these years. 
what is evidenced now here and there, who the players really are ultimately when you get them down to their most, get them out of their costumes and end up what they, what their function is, I guess is the point. As I said that earlier in the broadcast, don't put titles and isms and ists and all this on it. Look at the function. And if there's a greater world that looks at the world and defines it different, and that world, that greater world has a power to make it so or be so against your opinion, then you better look at it their way. You don't have to agree with it. You have to deal with that. And if you make it up in your mind what you think ought to be, you're going to walk yourself right into the bus. You step right off the curb and run right into that bus, and it don't care but to run you down. And now it's coming down, and you go high, you run away from the bus, and they don't like it because they saw you running away. They might actually track you down. The army has a day, uses Google and all these other Internet connections. Your health watch as you're running into the forest to hide. Your iPhone that's uh, in your pocket with the camera on as you stream to YouTube, showing how exciting it is. They're using all this stuff against us. And so there's a, how do you then take and turn that around? Do you put yourself in front of the train? Or do you, do you step offside the track? Try not to look so obvious is what I've been trying to show you how you do. When you have a problem because they've created an obstruction in, in your path, how do you, uh, what are the, uh, the analysis that it takes in order to, to uh, deal with it and then to deal with it and pass it? Or, or better, make it so it's not really there for you. You're not, it looks like it's there. It's the illusion put up. So the army is getting all this information using Google. They can actually find out uh, they have simulators now that go into any place and tell where exactly where anything is in the buildings, what they look like, how it works out. Amazon installing Alexa in apartments and hotel rooms. They say 24-7 data collection will help property managers better manage and serve the tenants. It's really the, the Israeli net of things is hot and heavy. I told you to stack them and pack them is going to be what it's all about, the smart cities. It's about surveillance. Amazon is now working with a hotel um Hotels and or apartment complex, these are contractors that get special uh, special uh, incentives to build these types of buildings in your cities or a city near you are going to be installing Alexa in the apartments to, for surveillance. They say they, they say that it helps property managers better serve the tenants. They never ask the tenant. These are two, two different levels of stakeholder here doing what they want against somebody's interest. Now, of course, there's going to be some, some fight about this, but I suspect it's not going to be enough. This is going to come in because people need places to live, and they'd rather expend their money on high-priced, small places that are wired than to live in the street. So this is a, a term called surveillance capitalism. There's a buck to be made. I told you that the, the big data is going to be the worst enemy of the people, and you're going to buy into it, and you're going to plug into it, and here's an evidence that uh, it's not bad enough that Google's uh, t teaming up with the Army to reconstruct, virtual reconstruct your towns and your houses and how you live and where you are, where you might be in the place, that when they decide you've said something wrong, they can come to your house and just pluck you out. They just have something come right through the roof and just pluck you out like some robot or something. The surgical extraction, no one would look around and, where, where's Fred? What's that hole doing in the roof? All because all these companies are working together to bring the data to the system of the people that have the power to harm you because you didn't say anything individually, uh, non-individually, however you want to, about privately, about the, the, the right you had counter to the policy. So it's it's all here for us, folks, to see the prison is there, and it's becoming more obvious how they're doing it, and they're utilizing all this electronics, which to me is fabulous technology. On the one hand, it's totally the panopticon on the other. And because none of you step up and start to work out how you're going to fix things, it's not going to be fixed. And I can just as I said that, my mind just turns. We're dealing with a county who's taken it on themselves to take on their the responsibility to their people in the county and their and their watershed and protect against fire and uh, proper forest management. And they're making rules now that are completely conducive to proper authority to help and protect the people and the watershed as against a federal authority that was actually causing them harm. 
So my point here is it's po you just give the right education, people will start to do the better thing. And I've got evidence of that now. If you continue to be quiet and don't engage this stuff and start working out what has to be done, it, it won't fix it. Bad don't fix itself. I don't know what else to say about this. Now surveillance capitalism, I told you big data was going to be your biggest enemy. It's now engaging in places before you even get to the building. It's already built in. So here's another. I don't know if I have enough time to do this one. In fact, I don't. Uh, quite a discussion. I guess I got here a little too late. I actually need a little bit of time. I wanted to go through. This is one of the issues I wanted to kind of take a take to, to task, but I don't know that I can. And I don't know if I want to anticipate this, although maybe I'll anticipate just a little bit for you. Here's a, a title. You're under arrest. How the police state muzzles our right to speak truth to power. And this is, again, I don't, the guy I'm sure has good in, good intentions. He's, he's warning you all about what's going on. My problem is, is like a lot of these people that are being cut out of the social media, uh, it's like a, it's just an incitement of all the all the harm you're up against. You know, when you hear me talk about how we, all the harm you're up against, I try to, I tell you how you're supposed, where you're supposed to step up and where that you can fix it and how to take the steps to begin to fix it. I just don't tell you the harm is out there. This guy kind of just sets out and says you're in a police state and he's an attorney and it's not that he says stuff that's wrong, but he never gives an insight as to, you know, you see how the state muzzles our right to speak truth to power. Well, my view is it doesn't. And so he goes by his rationale, but he doesn't tell you some things that we use. That our right to speak is not muzzled. And so before I go further on it, I'm going to stop right there with it. I think I want to take, I hope I can take a little bit of time to detail, maybe next week uh, on this, and maybe go through and show you how even someone in his best, uh, he wants to tell you what's going on. He's a good guy, I'm sure. Uh, but how we're falling short to listen where we're, we're, we're listening to this thing without any response, and that there are certain responses. That when you start throwing the responses in, your odds start, your right to speak is is not just a phrase. And as I've said, like in the interaction, your your point of first contact with a, an authority, a, you know, a cop or a or a code enforcer, it's critical to not to not be silent, uh, to, to not be silent, critical, but you don't just talk about the trees and the green and the bunnies and all, and all whatever, you know, or your rights, you are asserting something of an authority against those people, and the more the power they have to hurt you, the more to the crime level you have to go, and you have to just understand the statutes, as I've told you about before, when a authorita comes to try and take a right from you, and it does it underneath that warrant, with, underneath that color, without an actual warrant, and this is what you have to qualify, they're committing felonies. And a point of first contact is you, you get that stated on the record or for a record, whether that's being you filming or whether you write it down or you got a recorder running or I wouldn't rely on their recordings but because they'll turn them off, but just in case. Or you make a record after the fact and write it down and then certify it. But there's a way to address this. That a statement saying that how the police muzzle our right to speak truth to power is really a misleading condition and coming from an attorney. And I think, again, I want to maybe address that with you next week, hopefully. Uh, depends on what pops up and what comes to my mind. But thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said is encouraging to get your think thoughts up. Make that Go look in the mirror, folks. Decide whether you want to do something. Not we, but you. Go make that decision and go back out into the living room. Sit down and think about it. Choose something and start writing it down. Uh, thank you again, Grimner, what you do at reallibertymedia.com. And Jules over at ucy.tv to simulcast this. I do appreciate that. And then running it over on the uh, archives at YouTube. Again, all you folks that are doing the reproductions and the repostings of the broadcast, I really appreciate all that you do there. Few more people get to hear it. I hope someone, it, I hope it, 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 inver it invokes uh, some kind of empowerment for people to do something and they get involved in a better, proper way without getting in trouble. That's the whole point here. Stay ahead. Keep it arm's length from that as well. Arm's length distance. But uh, I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature will it. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
for opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 